An increasingly popular subject in the reptile community is the bioactive setup. So today Ed and I will be showing you how to put together a bioactive enclosure for a tropical setup in two slightly different ways so that you have your choice when you're building one at home. Both of our setups today will take place inside of 12 by 12 by 18 inch exoterra enclosures. They'll both be tropical and they'll both be set up for Cuban false chameleons that we've produced in the past. The main difference between them will be one will use primarily store-bought or pre-mixed substrate and the other one will contain more of a DIY or our own mixture for substrate. And then we're going to, in a future video, compare how they both perform so that we can figure out which one might work better for us, and maybe for you too. We will be setting up these two enclosures for our Cuban false chameleons that we produced the last couple of years. These are our holdbacks anyway. We have this big one right here. He was hatched at our place a year ago. We thought he was a female, which is the reason why we held him back. And we either missexed him or we sold the wrong one. So Chad, if you're watching this, can you check your false chameleon? It might be the girl we accidentally meant to keep. But if it is, that's fine, don't worry about it. Because the other one that the other habitat will be for is for this, for sure, a girl this time that we're also holding back. She's just this tiny little thing. She's just adorable. And she's going to have one mansion of a bioactive enclosure by the end of this video. Not only do bioactive setups provide more of like a natural look to your reptiles enclosure, but they also create a bit of their own ecosystem so that they are somewhat self-sustaining. The macroorganisms help clean up waste products and that goes back into the soil which helps the plant grow and it, the cycle just keeps going around. Not to say you don't have to do any cleaning whatsoever, but it definitely helps reduce the amount of cleaning you have to do. There are four or five different layers to a bioactive setup depending on how you look at these layers. Your bottommost layer is the drainage layer and this is what creates kind of a, an, an environment for beneficial bacteria and it helps aerate the soil above it and prevent it from becoming anaerobic or oxygen lacking. The next level up is your substrate barrier which literally just prevents the substrate above it from seeping through and mixing into the drainage layer. Above the substrate barrier is of course your substrate layer and this is where a lot of your macroorganisms are going to be burrowing around, aerating the soil, they'll be breaking down detritus or rotting matter which then breaks down and feeds the plants in that layer as well. So they kind of create that cycle mostly in that substrate layer. Above the substrate is your sphagnum moss and above that would be your leaf litter and both of those work together to help insulate the substrate below and therefore hold in humidity. It's in the sphagnum moss and leaf litter layer that you'll have isopods living as well. They don't burrow as much as the springtails do. So when you set up a bioactive enclosure you of course work from the bottom up so let's put in our drainage layer. So we have our two exoterra enclosures here and we kind of just want to test how our home concoction is going to work versus store-bought substrate layer. So that's why everything else is going to be the same between these two setups. But for our drainage layer, we're just going to use clay balls and you can get these from several different reptile product manufacturers like Zoomed, the BioDude, uh, Josh's Frogs. There's a few different options that you have. And if you want, you could instead use lava rock. And this is a very lightweight porous rock, just like how these clay balls are lightweight and porous. Basically you want something with a lot of surface area and the ability to soak in water so that when the water starts to dry out it can re-emit it back into the enclosure. It basically just hangs on to the water to keep the humidity levels more stable. And because of the amount of surface area that this porous substrate has, there's a lot of nooks and crannies for beneficial bacteria to cling on to and establish themselves. It's kind of similar to setting up a filter to a fish tank with your biological media, honestly. So you can use lava rocks if you want. They're a little more expensive though, so if you have them, like we got these off Craigslist with a green tree python that we bought, so we just have these on hand. But from what we can tell, clay balls are what most people use and they're a little bit cheaper. Your drainage layer should be a couple inches deep to allow water to pool at the bottom without it touching the substrate above. And you want about a half an inch of water at the bottom of these when your bioactive setup is 
active. If it completely dries out, then the beneficial bacteria that's living down here will also die. So that's why you need some moisture, some water, at the bottom of this drainage layer. When Ed and I were discussing setting these up, we were thinking about it, and there's beneficial bacteria not only in bioactive reptile setups, but also in fish tank filters. So we've never read of people doing this, but we figure, I don't know why it wouldn't help the situation, because right now these brand new pristine enclosures have no beneficial bacteria at all. It just naturally will build on its own. Or, like with fish tank filters, you can kickstart the bacteria colonies by squeezing out filtration media from an existing established tank filter. And there's a ton of bacteria, not only on the sponge, but now in the water that I just squeezed out. So we're gonna use this to kickstart the bacteria colonies in the bioactive setup. Bacteria is essential not only in bioactive setups, but also in like fish tanks because it breaks down waste products like the ammonia that reptiles produce that falls to the substrate and seeps through in with the water to the bottom of these. The bacteria will break down the ammonia into nitrites and then into nitrates, which get reabsorbed by the plants and actually act as the plant's food. Without the bacteria, the ammonia that's produced by the reptile's waste, any decaying plant matter, maybe dead macroinvertebrates, all collect all that ammonia collects at the bottom of the enclosure, which can be detrimental to the overall health of the tank. Since it usually takes a while for the bacteria to build, we figured we'd just, again, kickstart it by throwing in some beneficial bacteria from our fish tank. So if you know somebody who has a fish tank, you can do the same thing. Or you can go to a pet store, and if you ask them to take their um, filtration media and just squeeze it into a bag, that's full of good bacteria that you can use for your bioactive enclosure. Or you can buy a product called Stresszyme. I've used that before, and that works quite well, too. Just make sure to ask them nicely. Yeah, ask them nicely. I'm getting their position. All right, the next layer is an easy one, I promise. On top of the drainage layer, you simply just have to put a substrate barrier to separate the drainage layer from the substrate that's gonna go on top of it. There's a lot of reptile stores that sell this that's cut to size for commonly used enclosure sizes, but you can also just get screen door mesh from like a local hardware store, which is what we did here. And then we just cut it to size. This we're just going to simply place on top of the drainage layer. The next layer is your substrate layer, and this is what we're going to tweak a little bit between the two setups. So give me a second to explain how we're going to set this up. The substrate layer is something that you can tweak and perfect on your own, and that's going to be the biggest difference between these two setups. We're going to use one substrate layer that is prepackaged and store-bought. In the, today's case, we're going to use a mixture from Josh's Frogs. This is their ABG mix, or Atlanta Botanical Gardens mix, and it's been around for quite a while, which is why we wanted to use this one today. They're not a sponsor or anything, but it's a good tried and true um, substrate layer to use. This mixture contains tree fern, fir bark, charcoal, which is also known as carbon, sphagnum moss, and peat, aka peat moss. And it's the peat that we're actually going to try to eliminate in our concoction for a substrate layer because it works very well. It's a great nutritious ingredient for the macroinvertebrates running around in the substrate layer. However, there's debate on it being more of a finite resource and not very sustainably collected from the wild. You see, peat is basically sphagnum moss that has died in a bog and it sinks to the bottom and collects, becomes very compacted, but provides very nutritious substrate to use in our bioactive enclosures. However, in order to collect peat moss, they have to excavate it by digging to the bottom of a bog and they pull it out, which essentially destroys the bog and the natural habitat of countless species of not only reptiles and amphibians, but other animals as well. It also takes a very long time for peat moss to reaccumulate at the bottom of a bog, which is why people are kind of saying that it's more of a finite resource, just because of how long it takes to reestablish itself. Peat moss isn't something that's just a concern in the reptile community, it's really a concern for all of horticulture, because peat moss is used in just about any soil that you find at stores. For this video, we originally bought an organic soil thinking that it was peat moss free, and it turned out to have peat moss in it. We could not find any soils at the store that were peat moss free, so this is something that hopefully in the future gardeners and horticulturists start avoid using because of how damaging to the environment peat moss really is. The good news is that there are easy alternatives to peat moss that you can use instead for your substrate layer. So that's what we're going to test in this video is the uh, two different types 
peat moss included and peat moss free. Our combination for a substrate layer will consist of blended coconut, which is also known as coir, I think it's pronounced, and that's gonna be our substitute for peat moss. It should do the same job as peat moss does without it being as damaging to the environment. It also contains sphagnum moss, carbon, AKA charcoal, sand, tree fern, and crushed leaves. To get an idea of the consistency we're looking for, since we've never made this before, uh, we're going to mix up the ABG mix just to get an idea of what the ratios of everything should be and what it kind of should look like. For this size of Exoterra, the 12 by 12 by 18, you need approximately four quarts for your substrate layer, which is perfectly what this bag is. To the mixture, you have to add in some dechlorinated water, enough so that when you squeeze it, it doesn't drip, but it holds its shape. Kind of like perlite or vermiculite for incubating eggs, actually. And Ed insisted on using his Ed Roberts mug. Doesn't drip. Yeah, there we go. Our base is going to be primarily compressed coconut and tree fern. This was the most expensive product to get, or most expensive ingredients, but you can usually, you can find it online and you can often find it at reptile specialty stores too. And in smaller quantities, we'll be adding in our activated charcoal or carbon, sphagnum moss, sand, and leaf litter. All of these ingredients are basically a food source for the macro invertebrates that are gonna be running around in the substrate layer. I mean, they eat detritus, so they'll eat these leaves that break down, the sphagnum moss, the uh, tree fern, Just just about all of these provide not only a place for them to burrow into, but it's also a source of food for them. The sand will help aerate the soil and prevent it from clumping together, which will therefore allow water to seep through easier. And the charcoal in here will provide another source of nutrients, but for the plants. Get a good feel there and then get a good feel that there. That is pretty close now. Yeah, I'd say we're probably good. We have our substrate layer mixed up and I think it's a pretty similar consistency to Josh's Frog's ABG mix. So I think we're, we're pretty happy with how this turned out. The only other thing we wanted to add to it, which we couldn't find in time, was some compost. Compost would have provided another source of of food basically for not only the macroorganisms but also the plants but we couldn't find any so we'll just do without. So now we're going to pour all of the contents from each bin into the exoterras. Okay messy process but there you go. Now is the point where you want to plant any live plants you want to add before you add the other stuff on top. So for sanity's sake, to keep everything the same in this kind of experiment we're doing, we're going to use an arrowhead plant in each one, along with a string of pothos in each. There we go. I tried to plant them in a similar fashion to keep that the same too. And now I'm just going to add the climbing branches for the false chameleons. And then just as one more source of food for the uh, isopods and the springtails we're gonna put in here, we're just gonna throw in some shed skin because they eat that too. The next layer is going to be the sphagnum moss on top of your substrate layer here, and we're going to dip it into some water to hydrate it first. We're making a huge mess doing this. Yeah, don't expect to be clean if you're doing a bioactive enclosure. By the way, we swapped the enclosures just so it's the ABG one is closer to me so I can e more easily reach it. But the sphagnum moss is used to help insulate and hold in all the moisture below and therefore it won't dry out as quickly. It also gives a place for isopods to run around since they don't burrow into the substrate layer as much as the springtails do. And finally, the sphagnum moss layer also helps prevent the animal inside from ingesting too much soil. The final layer is the leaf litter. And oh, thanks. I almost hit the plant! Huh? Huh? Uh, don't, that one's open! Oh my gosh. Both open. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. For the leaf layer, which is also going to add another layer of insulation to all the moisture below, and it also gives more shelter for the isopods, and I mean, they'll eat these as they decompose, we're just going to sprinkle these magnolia leaves over the top of the sphagnum moss. You can get these from, again, many reptile product manufacturers. You can probably buy them in bulk from non-reptile companies too. These are from Pangea, but I know Josh's Frogs and the BioDude also carry these leaves. And this layer can be pretty thick because as they decompose, they'll just provide food and more insulation to what's underneath them. Ta-da, there we go. 
And now to help out the plants and just everything, since it's all fluff still, we're just gonna add a little bit of water. Now we get to add life to them. These are our springtails. And They're, our snails. And our snails, baby snails. I mean, if they come with it, that's fine. You don't need a whole lot of this. And now we're gonna add isopods. We have all sorts of different kinds that we're gonna throw in these uh, enclosures. Well, we added lights and we have both the UVB light for these guys as well as halogens because, well, we've been switching a lot of our basking bulbs from the traditional ones to halogens because they get hotter and they use a lot less electricity. So I'd suggest moving to those too. But we have them labeled. This is the ABG or Josh's Frogs pre-mixed substrate layer. And this one over here is the Snake Discovery Awesome Mix substrate. We are going to just see how they do basically. We're gonna give them a couple months, keep everything you know wet. You wanna maintain about a half an inch of water at the bottom of your drainage layer here for things to keep alive and keep cycling through. And then we'll touch base uh, in a couple months to let you know how each are doing. We're going to keep in mind that this plant did start out taller than the other one. That's really the only difference between the two though. Let's add our little false chameleons. We're gonna put in this little female first. We'll see how she does. Here you go. What Aww. in the world? Oh my gosh, she's just so cute. <laughs> All right, she's gonna go get comfy on her branch. Perfect. And I need some heat and then I need some UVB. So let's put in the male from last year that we produced. He is kind of sassy, so he might kind of show off a bit when I pick him up. Oh, sure, for the camera, you're gonna be a doll. And he's like, I'm not mean at all. I don't try to bite people when they pick me up. Of course, never, never. Why would you do, dude? You're gonna be nice on camera? Oh, of course, okay. Well, we're gonna set him in here. There you go, buddy. You go get comfy on a branch. Find a happy spot. Oh, he's just gonna sit exactly where I put him. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you guys for watching today's video on how to create a bioactive enclosure. If you decide to make one of your own based off of this video, let us know if you end up using a pre-made uh, substrate layer or if you make your own. And if you do that, let us know if you tweak the substrate layer at all. We're always looking for new ideas on how to improve habitats. And this is our first like truly bioactive enclosure setup video we've ever done. And we are new to bioactive enclosures ourselves, so we wanna learn more. As always, thank you to our Patreon supporters for backing this channel. We love all of your support. You guys are amazing. Thank you, and thank you to everyone just watching today's video. I hope you learned something new, and hopefully this helps you put together your own bioactive setup someday. Thanks everybody for watching, and we'll see you next time.